All right, welcome back to the Sean Trey Show. I have a special guest with me tonight, and uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Carl Winery. I'm a cinematographer. I make music videos. I just finished a movie called Jason Rising. Um, I'm a musician. I'm in two bands, one called Vinnercy, one called Ligature Marks. And uh, despite that, I would not label myself as a creative person, which is interesting. I mean, yeah, kind of hilarious to some people, but uh, that's fun. Yeah, anyway, thanks for having me on. No, no worries. So, 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 so uh, you can't drop that 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 that, that bomb and then uh, and not have me ask about it. Like, so, what do you mean that you're not a creative person? Uh, I would never label myself as one. Um, okay. I, I think of myself as like a little bit more like practical, if that makes sense. Like, uh, I have friends that I consider very artistic and super inventive. Um, I, I view myself more as like I just work hard at things, and if I want to get something done, I have to work really hard at it. So I, you know, I just put in the time, put in the effort, make things happen. I, um, I've got a match with you. My my wife is a is a is a famous singer here in Vietnam, and uh, she's a straight up diva. She was like first winner of Vietnam Idol, and she she's she's wow. an artiste, you know. Uh, yeah. I say it in the in the fancy way right there, an artiste, and, and you know she she's one of those people. But 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 we have this very we have this very um, you know yin and yang type of a. Uh, of a thing because for me I'm also actually not super creative you know if I if I could I'd wear a t-shirt and jeans every single day and I'm okay with that I'm wearing now <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay with that you know I was watching the Met Gala uh, and people were posting these photos and I don't have anything against the outfits but I was just like I probably if I ever got invited to that would show up in a t-shirt and jeans I'd probably still just do the same thing yeah yeah but, you know, a lot of those, like, the outfits were nuts, but I think the reason they were doing that was just to make it a big splash on social media, and it worked, you know? It works. I mean, it works. Yeah. But <laughs> I get you I get you what you're saying, though, because my wife, though, she 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 looks at me, and she's like, Pfft. but yet, I like what you said, because I'm, I'm the same. Like, people ask me, what does a producer do? So, for most of my work, for a long time, I've done a lot of producing for social media content, for companies, for actors, for, for bands, and I'm like, I get shit done. And how do I just, it's like one slog at a time and I'm really good at making checklists. I'm really, really good at making a checklist. And I just go, this is our next step. This is our next step. Because, you know, and then I I love bringing in people who are way more creative than me to kind of partner up with. Yeah, but, and, and, and it's not ahead. like I can't, you know, I have, I remember I have like little bursts too, where you just come up with like tons of ideas and then, you know, you work on them for like the next year, year and a half or something like that. Like mm-hmm. uh, Vinner C had, we have six songs in an album and one writing session for music video ideas. I came up with four ideas for music videos and some of them were more flushed out than others, but um, we executed on all four of those ideas. But, That's you know, awesome. now that we have two left, I'm like, I don't know what to do with them. <laughs> <laughs> like we get there yeah right well that's but, awesome like you said, it's, a, it's a checklist factor it's you know it's it's okay you know i have this idea but i can also execute it i don't have to have i mean and i love having a big team if you have a good team around you surrounding yourself it just elevates everything so huge fan of that um but i also know i can just get things done myself i don't have to rely on anyone to do it i can you know yeah. put one foot in front of the other and just work through it and and make uh you know uh crazy art that people like we did a video last summer and i don't mean to jump around but we did a video last summer that had like three or four impossible uh three or four impossible tasks in it and they were just impossible until they were done and i don't know if you watched the crack a light video with vinner scene but i i I didn't see that one yet but i will i will i will dive okay cool so we built a 20-foot boat um and i was telling people i wanted a boat and i wanted to take it to the desert and i also wanted to do a stranger thing style like void at the end of the video and the boat, um, you know, I don't think anybody, everyone in the band was like, oh, okay, cool. The, the song kind of had like a little pirate vibe, uh, but I figured filming in the ocean would be too hard. But if we take on a desert and make it look like this, it's this epic journey for this epic song, then, you know, we're in a pretty good spot and it's like really cool. And it's kind of like a weird juxtaposition. People would probably dig it. Um, and the desert here is 400 miles away from where we live right now. So oh, we had, man. you know, to take this boat 400 miles, make sure it lived. Uh, and I've never built a boat, but I was like, I think this is what I have to do. And everyone in the band was kind of like, okay, yeah, sure. And my wife was like, well, let me find you boats. 
you know, I'm sure there's some busted boats you can use as like a chassis or something. I was like, no, that's not what I'm after. So um, one weekend I picked up my little brother, you know, I watched like three YouTube videos on building boats and I was like, well, shit, well, thankfully this doesn't have to float. And then um, <laughs> we went to Home Depot and like four trips later we had, I don't know, 60% of the boat built over two days and then just kept working on it. And, you know, thankfully it didn't have to float, um, but it looked like a, like a medieval-ish boat very um utilitarian like there's not a whole lot of flourishes the biggest flourish was the boat had a the bow of it leaned forward and it looked kind of um stealthy a little bit or something like that but you That's know awesome. it was pretty cool and then we had to transport it had to get uh filming permits with the blm uh here in oregon which is the borough of land management and that was just a, a crazy fun process to work with them because they're not used to doing music video permits very very often um there for phone permits and so it was just a fun process and then we built a stranger things style void and that was an adventure in itself too so it was like a little pool maybe like that much water okay 40 by 40 feet and then we put the boat in it too um and we managed to do it but there is you know it was a, it was a crazy amount of work to make this thing happen and we built costumes for it um but you know we every impossible task got knocked down and you know I, it was funny because when it was done, everybody was like, oh, wow, I didn't think this was going to happen. Like, I thought we were going to fail here, 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 and here. And I was like, no. But it was, you know, weekly meetings with myself, uh, Freddie Heath, who works on a lot of the projects with me, um, and uh, one of the guitar players in the band. But, you know, we managed to knock it down and take care of everything. That's awesome. My, my, my wife, like, she always, when she gets a music video, she's like, <laughs> she's like, she throws me a, an impossible task. And she's like, this is what I want. Do this for me. And I'm looking at it going, I have no idea how the, how the hell I'm going to do that. But, y you know, sometimes those things actually are the things that make you grow the most. Because totally. they completely blow you out of your comfort zone. And then afterwards, yeah. you're like, if I hadn't have done that, I never in any way, shape or form would have known how to pull that off. Yeah. And now, now, now you've got that in your bag of tricks, which is absolutely awesome. And then sometimes you're like, well, this is really easy. I just, I didn't know the steps to get there or it's a little bit weird, but now I can reproduce this and, and do this like it's nothing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, that's, that's cool. really interesting. That's awesome. Well, well, I, I watched uh, Jason is right. Jason rising, right? Yeah. I watched it and I was, I was really blown away by a couple of things. Like, and I wanted to pick your brain about this because this is an area that I, I, I'm fascinated by fan films, you know, of all of the genres because they, they're, they're so cool and they do such respect to the original if they're done right. And you, you guys did that, you know, it was really, and I watched it and I was like, dude, it, it wasn't just because it wasn't just the tone it wasn't just the style it was the camera angles it was the the you had you really had to think carefully like one of the the, the best examples of this i've seen recently was um wandavision yeah. what, did you watch it yet because yeah. we would sit there and we, we think about a tv show in, in terms of a story but like they had to think about way more than that you know what was the tone what was the underlying things that you know were regular facets of a you know the 50s you had that laugh track you had everyone was happy you know there's all these little things that you have to consider and and, and when you are paying homage to an absolute classic there are things that have to be considered <laughs> now, tell me tell me tell me what were some of the things that you you, you guys thought about when you were getting into this process yeah, great question. Uh, just to really, the fun thing on WandaVision, I I feel like they probably had a really good kind of tone or like feel outline. And so and when they were filming scenes, really sure it wasn't all in order. They were like, okay, this is the 50s thing. Here is the more serious part. Here's this. And so they probably had pretty good consistency, but that meant, you know, you had to plan that out ahead of time. You can't go back and retroactively do that. So... No. I, you know, I remember watching, I was like, one, I bet this is a blast, and two, holy crap, they had this prepared, because there's no meaning right. in that. Yeah. No. Yeah. Everything, everything, you know, I, my friend is a, a, is a AD on some really big projects, right? 
and she she works for the Marvel stuff and all that. And she was sending me right now. She's working in Boston on the uh, the new um, Ryan Reynolds Will Ferrell movie. And she posted on her Facebook about like the flow chart just for the background actors that day. And literally, it was like a flow chart through from hair and makeup to holding to costumes. And it was like, it was this crazy flow chart because it was like about 60 different extras that all had to go through hair and makeup and costumes and all this. And she had this intricate flow chart. And I was like, and that was just for handling the extras. And it's like, you, yeah. you can't even imagine the scale of these these productions. You know what I mean? That like, yeah. cause WandaVision was, one of the things I noticed with WandaVision too, like, that was a big cast. That was a that was a a, a hefty cast for most every episode. There wasn't. Yeah. That was that was something to think about. Yeah, and so for us, was interesting. You know, we we started this in we started filming two years ago. Um, it took just over two years to finish the movie. We got hit by COVID, so our whole plan yeah. was to film over weekends, and then we had um, a delay with the script. Where you know we thought our script was in really good shape and then you start filming and you kind of start seeing the cracks in it and so i, I just hadn't hadn't been through enough revisions and so that was one of the problems with the project um and and so we paused things so we could work that out and then we went to go kick things back up we got two weekends in and then um our makeup artist who did the zombie pamela makeup she is amazing and she does stuff for like netflix's oa and like all sorts of huge things and uh, she That's got awesome. a really good contract for a show and we're like, well, go take it. You know, we'll, we'll still be here. We'll work on other pieces, but it kind of delayed our Pam filming part. And we we're like, okay, well, we'll get back together in three months. Not a big deal. We'll just keep working on what we have and it will just help the rest of it be that much better. Well, then COVID hit and just shut everything down. So we had yeah. a, a couple good chances to, um, you know, work on what we had already filmed spot any cracks in it and then try to work on improving it. So we had a couple times where, you know, we had to go rebuild the intensity because we wanted it to shift. So originally the intensity where things start like kind of like, oh God, they find a body and they start kind of figuring out somebody's not here or there's some, somebody else is here and killing people. Like what's going on? Um, we, we tried to shift where that at. Originally it was like later in the movie. So we ended up having to refilm a few scenes um, it, or just like get a couple extra, um, pieces like chunks to, to insert so like you have that little rise in action happen a little bit faster and so one of the things that we tried mm. to do with the movie is we were trying to make it a really fast hour we you know there's been some other fan films that have come out where you know they're an hour and a half because they want a feature but it really was a 40 minute story and for us we yeah. wanted to make sure that the story was the first and foremost thing that we were working that that people saw we didn't want extra time in there just to stroke our egos or to have a uh, you know a full feature that's 120 minutes we we're like nope story's going to dictate where we go and that kind of helped um inform what made it in the movie what didn't and how we were building it and because we were able to edit as we were filming because we you know shoot, we shoot two days on the weekend edit throughout the week we were able to help kind of build that tension and and you know have it just like skate off when we wanted it to and kind of explode versus um the original version like it was uh, originally a little bit slower um mm. but it was you know it was hard shooting over the weekends, pausing for the pandemic, coming back and trying to make sure actors knew exactly where they were at in the movie. Yeah. So that got, well, I mean, yeah. things like hair, you know, and people, <sighs> did someone shave? Did people different cut their way. hair? Yeah. Oh, and so our way. actors were committed for two years. They didn't, nobody knew this. Oh. None of us knew this, but you know, I think when people went into it, I don't know if anybody knew what to expect, but then once we got past the first two weeks and we had the first day where Jason pulls his, the sack off his head and like stomps over and acts as somebody to death, I think everybody was like, wow, we got something. Like there were some moments on set where they, it felt electric. And um, at that point, I think everybody was like, this feels pretty special. We got something cool and people became a lot more committed. So when we did need people to reprise their roles for you know more filming they were fine and like one of our actors actually two of them got other parts and said i have to keep my look because we're still working on this other project and thankfully the other film said oh okay cool yeah no problem all right so so oh, yeah. that's interesting two years committed and, and people you know were a lot of people probably had day jobs and things that they yep. had to kind of to deal with was yep. it, what what was what, what were some of the other major obstacles that you guys had to deal with to, to get this done 
So obviously the pandemic is huge. Um, you know, we have a cameo from somebody who was in the original, the Friday the 13th at the end of our movie. And uh, she is 70 and she's a complete badass. But because of her age bracket and risk, uh, we delayed oh. filming the ending of the movie for quite a while until we could make sure that we had, she was vaccinated and that, you know, COVID is a lot more known. So we had better precautions in place. But so we ended up pausing for quite a while on that portion of the filming. Um, so, so, but we were looking at like, well, we have to get the movie done at some point. Do we wait for her? Do we not? And we really wanted to. Um, and thankfully that ended up working out nice. But in between this November of last year to the release of the movie, we had an ice storm that came in and wiped out our camp in Lair. I mean, just knocked Whoa. over a million trees in our area. And it, the, the you want to look at the positive side and stuff. We... You know, our camp, we kind of used our woods as much as we could. There's some very distinctive trees, and yeah, we, we kind of couldn't reuse any of our woods in that area. Well, the ice storm comes through and knocks everything down, and it's like, well, that destroyed our camp, that destroyed our lair. We rebuilt the lair, but now the woods look different. We can shoot here more, and it, no one will notice, which is great. Oh, so, yeah, you awesome. have to look on the bright side on that stuff. But that definitely right. hurt us on uh, filming a little bit because we, we did have to rebuild our lair. And then we couldn't do one scene at the camp like we wanted. We, we had kind of wanted uh, Adrian in the camp, but, you know, the camp got wiped out. And it's like, you know, I don't feel like spending two grand on cabins for one scene. Um, right. We also had uh, biblical, biblical level fires here in Oregon. So Oregon's been on fire the last two, three years, like kind of crazy. And our where our camp is located is at a relative of the directors. And uh, they had to evacuate last year because of the fires. Oh, wow. And then we had the smoke from all the fires that was so bad that, you know, another day we were supposed to film, you couldn't go outside. And yeah, I, I mean, it was I, just I'm, like one, I, one thing. My after family's another. in Northern California. So I understand yeah. when those, when those fires hit, man, it's just like, people don't understand. Like the, it's all orange. It looks like you're in like apocalyptic it, landscape. Yeah, it's, it's, it's locked. Nuts. It's locked up. So it mm -hmm. was really brutal. Uh, and so that was pretty demoralizing. Cause you had like three, three months there where you just, you couldn't really do anything. We weren't sure like, if our camp's gonna be there, we also weren't sure if our friend's house was gonna get lost. Like, I mean, this oh, is, it, that was pretty catastrophic for a minute. Thankfully, nothing on their property got damaged, but I mean, it got within like a mile or two of them. It was really crazy and it looked really bad for a minute. Um, that was, you know, we had several people on the cast and crew catch COVID, not on set, um, oh, wow. but during that initial pause. And so, you know, somebody got really sick and we were hoping that, you know, they would, they would make it. Uh, on that note, one of the, the guy who was originally going to direct the movie, his name is Robert Blanche, and he was in, he's been in like movies with De Niro, he was on It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. He awesome. started getting sick as we were leaning up to the movie, and he had, a, he had a lung issue, but it turned out he had to get a transplant. So he got a lung transplant, he ended up in the hospital, wow. and he was like, I can't direct this, I'm going to be in here for a while. So we tried to find a different director and went through a process with uh, somebody on that and the person ended up passing. So the, the writer, James, ended up directing it. He wasn't originally going to. Uh, and unfortunately, Robert passed. Um, and it was this was before COVID hit. But I mean, it was, you know, we started off on a weird foot. And, yeah. it, it, you know, it was... Uh, one obstacle after another, but that's, you know, that's how any of these projects are. You just, you, you run into problems. Like I, I do IT work for a living and my whole job is just fixing stuff. And you know, when yeah. you work on film sets, it's no different. I mean, every day there's some sort of crazy obstacle. Somebody forgot a cable, um, show up and like the property owner isn't quite up, you know, like I didn't know what I signing myself up for, or, you know, who yeah. knows what it is. Uh, somebody shows up late with something. You're just always problem solving every time. Like the location we, we changed, to shoot today. scouted. Yeah, we had to shoot today with my wife, and, it, and it's it's a it, we're we're still in a lockdown here in Vietnam. Like the COVID situation here with the Delta slammed us, and so yeah. they just started easing restrictions. But you know, normally I've got when we're shooting something, I've got a team helping me out, and it's me, and me, and just me. You know, and it's yeah. like, and then, and I'm running, you know, audio. I'm running cameras. I'm running lights. I'm running, you know, I'm, I'm doing everything. And and then what I just have to always remind myself is is you know you back up your backup and you back that up you know what i mean it's like yep. you have all of your bases covered I, I i used to be roommates with this one guy who was a navy seal and uh it was a navy seal now he's moved into making really high-end knives uh andy arabito cool guy nice. and um 
Yeah, look up half face half face blades on on Instagram. But half face blades and uh, but Andy, and, and, you know, he used to always tell me you got to these seals. They would always prepare for everything, and it's like you uh, you prepare for every eventuality, and then then nothing catches you off guard. Yep. You know, and and I I love to bring that that attitude to filmmaking, and especially when you are working on a large large feature. You know, it, it's like you know, I remember being on set of some big, big, big projects in L.A. There, there were people, it was costing, you know, over a million a day to run this production. And, and like, there's no room for error. There's no room to mess up. And yep. if you do, you will very, very quickly be replaced <laughs> by someone who won't mess up. Yep. It's crazy like that, you know. Um, yep. But... Coming back to, to how did you get into film? Great question. Uh, I started out in music and I was in a band and we did a tour and I brought like a little horrible JVC camcorder thing and I figured I'd document the tour. And so I'd, I'd film everything we were doing and edit and make little tour update videos. And I really enjoyed that. And then um, one of my wife's friends did a lot of short films and 48 hour film festivals. And so his name's Freddie Heath and we still work together, but he, you know, I did some short films and 48 hour film festivals with, uh, with Freddie and some other friends. And those were really fun. Kind of dropped out from doing that for a while, focused a lot on music. And then um, we, my band did a music video with somebody and it was so close to being good, but it wasn't quite good. And then, yeah. Yeah, so close, but not not there. And then we did another one with somebody else, so close to being good, but not quite there. And then I did one with Freddie, and it was really good, but like not quite as edgy as I had wanted. And mm. I was just like, you know, I do have a vision on a lot of this, and we're not getting to it. And I, you know, I think I can do this. So I ended up buying a cheap DSLR and made a music video. And I was like, well, this is, you know, it's not great, but it's, it's what I wanted. It's better than the other ones, at least for, for what I was after. And that kind of started that spark. And then after, I think, three videos for myself, I started doing videos for other people. And, nice. uh, you know, had a couple of them that hit kind of big earlier. Like one has a million view, over a million views. And then, That's um, awesome. yeah, I just kept going. So I've been at, at the music videos pretty hard since 2017. So we've done over, over 100. Um, yeah, maybe 150 or something now. I, I don't even keep track at this point. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, that's really cool because it also, I, I, one of the things that you, you sent me the samples of your work, and one of the things, I, I the tone of your work is really interesting. Can you tell me about the tone of a lot of your work? Just to like, what, what's your, your genre that you really fall into? Yeah, so if somebody, we'll start going negative. Somebody came to me and said, hey, we got this really happy song, these really happy visuals. I'd probably be like, meh. Uh, not for me like that's just not <laughs> what my normal thing is so for me i love doing things that are a little bit like darker a little bit more aggressive um i i kind of like things that are a little bit gritty so mm. i and that's one of the things i loved about jason rising was you know we had a chance to really spend the time and i learned so much on the production like how to make things look how you want so we james was amazing at aging aging things so like i my happy place was going to a gnarly old mausoleum that was half finished and nice. filming things in there when it's like super wet and, and dripping and um you know that that is my happy place when i'm filming so like a junkyard sure let's go on a day where there's an ice storm this is completely right. unique it's horrible and like i'm so happy the entire time it's like 30 degrees out and i'm just like hey this is great freezing rain sure it's not gonna kill my camera we're good uh that is that is my my thing i like to go for the weird stuff uh, a little bit off the beaten path not the happy side of the train tracks it's going to be on the other side that's awesome now yeah. and, and that's that's really cool because you know i i find that I mean, one of the reasons that i was really interested in your work is because you you see especially with music videos like people really skew toward like there's a lot of people making stuff over here, but less people making stuff over here, you know? And, and I feel like it's just, it's fun to look at people who can look at the world in a different way. And I love how you, the, the, the mausoleum that's dripping rain, you know, it, a lot of people are like, oh, no, I don't want to shoot in there. But like, that's awesome. And visually, yeah. visually, it's beautiful, you know? Yep. Because, so you know how I found you? I actually found you from an article on No Film School. Because you wrote about the uh, shooting with the black magic, 
Yeah. Now, now, are you shooting the Black Magic still? Yep. Which, which one do you have? The 4K, 6K? I have uh, two of the Pocket 4Ks. Um, nice. I love I have those cameras. 4K as well. I love it. Oh, nice. Yeah, and the 4K, what's great, I started with Nikon DSLRs, so I have a lot of Nikon glass. And then you when the, the Micro Four Thirds came out, yeah, it's just so nice. And so I have some some speed booster, some non-speed booster, and uh, it just allows me to use anything. And I have I have like Sony cameras. I've owned the I have an A six thousand right now, but I own like um, A seven S one and twos, and and I, I kind of like them, but like the Nikon's look better to me, so I stuck with the Nikon. Mm-hmm. And then when we did uh, when we started in Jason Rising, then we did a bunch of camera tests and tried the Nikon's and uh, Sony's, and I just. I don't know. I didn't dig them as much as the original Black Magic Pocket, and then the 4Ks came out, and I'm like, well, they look way different, but it still looks amazing, and it still looks better than the others for for what we are trying to do for Jason Rising. Um, mm-hmm. And I just I love the feature set on them. I mean, and they just got better. Like when we first started filming, they didn't do the Bluetooth time code sync. Um, mm-hmm. There's the time code, you know, whatever, and and now they do that, and it's just so incredible. I mean, if if I were to do this, the next movie, we're like, okay, we're going to time code everything and, you know, we can throw it in resolve and click and have it sync. I mean, I can't tell you how many times it's been the next, the first four hours after filming late at night, syncing audio on all the tracks while it was still right. fresh in my head. You know, hours and hours and hours every time we filmed. Yep. And that's what's yep. awesome is like they have these features in there. And, and um, with the Black Magic, so how I got into Black Magic, I originally started out with uh, Panasonic. I was using the GH4, and I bought a bunch of um, I bought a bunch of native glass. For it's glass, but it was all Olympus because the Olympus makes the nicer stuff than Panasonic did. You know, the Olympus Pro line was great, and so when I I just grab that, and I throw it on the uh, the Black Magic, and I love it. But one of the things that I I, I liked in your article and you kind of pointed at and I, I really enjoy now and this is a common theme that comes up again and again and again is how prohibitive getting into making movies used to be versus how ridiculously simple not simple but how much easier yeah. it is now I don't want to say yeah. ridiculously simple that's a major oversimplification but how much <laughs> easier it is now Comparatively, though, I mean, it's it's so much easier now. The bottleneck is, you know, do you have good ideas, right? Because yes. it's there's the lights that are out there, the cameras, the lenses. I mean, you can get a really professional look and sound pretty easily. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so the the bar of quality is a lot higher than it used to be. And but what separates you from the pack now is going to be stories or or things that are different and more inventive. So you really have to be kind of like um, innovating on every project that you do. Yeah. And, uh, you know, which is good, but it just means you got to work hard. But that's no different than it was. Like, you know, the hard work always rises to the top, I think. Um, exactly. Assuming you can promote yourself properly, too. You yeah. promote the work properly. Well, that's what I, I'm 100% believer in, in. Quantity is legit, you know? Quality is super important, but you got to yep. just, you, you got to get, get your numbers out there, you know? You yep. got to put things out. And you but, have to learn. I mean, that's the reason yes. I got to the point where I could do this was we did a hundred music, vi- over a hundred music videos. And, you know, you never quite know what you're getting into despite, um, planning and preparing. And that saved our bacon on the shoot. The Freddie and I shot 90, we, we had uh, four people holding cameras on the movie at various points. And, uh, three of us shot, have shot tons of music vid- videos together. And, uh, the other guy didn't, but he's great. And, you know, it's just that ability to be super flexible and adapt. Like we had a night where one of the weapons that we were using to kill somebody broke before we got a chance to finish the kill. And you're oh. like, wow, great. Like, what do you do now? How do you save this night? It's two o'clock in the morning. You're supposed to be over in two hours and we're trying to make this work. So, you just kind of have to not let those things get you and just kind of roll with it and and just adapt and, and deal with it. And, you know, the whole process of the movie, not every night was that bad, but like, you know, like every time you film, like something goes wrong. Like you said, you have to kind of prepare and have backups for the backups and, and just think through everything. And, and when crap happens, you're just be able to deal with it way better. I, I think that that's one of the best analogies and the idea of just rolling with the punches. You know, you, you're not gonna, in, in Someone that I, I was chatting with recently brought up this idea of we, it was, except it was in reference to music. He was talking about how, you know, don't, don't try to be perfect. Perfection, you know, if you try to be perfect, overrated. yeah, it's overrated. You know, it's like, get it out. 
Yep. Make it, you know, get it yeah. done however you can. You know, if you watch even major Hollywood movies, if you really want to start watching for continuity errors, they're everywhere. They don't care. And that was one of the things that we, you know, we shot with two cameras on this. So we didn't, if there was a take we liked, we could use both angles. We didn't have to worry about exactly. was her hand up or down. But there was still a couple times where, you know, somebody's hair was over the ear or not or something that was kind of distracting. And we we're just like, you know what? We're going to roll with it. And nobody's caught it never seen mm -hmm. and there's people who flamed us online and, and pointed out every single flaw and they haven't caught some of those and i'm like <laughs> if you want to know what's wrong with the movie i can tell you because i've seen every every part of it but <laughs> right? uh you know you watch hollywood stuff all the time and like go for the story fo focus on the story and also like you said i have I, bringing back to music on that example i have a friend who is probably one of the most talented singers i've worked with and he does all sorts of great music his band's awesome but they don't put anything out recorded because he's such a perfectionist on it. And I'm like, you could have been famous if you just put right. stuff out. And it doesn't have to be perfect. Like, it just needs to be good enough. And I'm exactly. on that good enough area where I'm like, you know what, the song's good enough, it's done. And I, I always think, wow, it'd be nice to go back and fix it. And I never do. But, like, you just get it out. Get it out. Keep get working. It out, get it done. Yeah, and then you can move on to other stuff. You don't have to have that thing hanging in your head or go back to it. Um, and every time you learn, you know, you, you'll be surprised the things that you think aren't okay resonate really well with people. And you're like, oh, right. and then you talk to people and you figure out what it is that stuck with it. Now I'm going to add that to my uh, bag of tricks going forward. And right. yeah, you just you learn more by putting stuff out there and doing it and, and finishing it. You know, it's and then I think that's something that thing that people don't always think about because people get so caught up in the way it's supposed to be the way and especially this is something i noticed when i lived in la like especially for the film industry like that's not the way it's done well, but who cares man just you know and it's like it, it's it's that it's that establishment but i i honestly feel like a lot of that is is done to keep people from trying to keep yeah. people from trying to climb the ranks. And, and I, I, I think it's this this mentality that's propagated to kind of keep people like, you know, it, there's this, it's this club, you know, and the people that are in the club, they want to stay in the club. And the yeah. people who it's aren't like, in the club. They don't club, want you coming in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They don't want new people in the club. And why would I want new people in the club? Because then I might lose my place, you know. But I, I think that, and this is what I love about all of these cameras and stuff. I feel like there's this revolution in filmmaking happening that, you know, because think about it, let's be real, you know, I guarantee you that some of the greatest possible directors in the 40s, 50s, and 60s never made it because there was this wall of, yep. of, of um, ability, not ability, a wall of ability wasn't there. That wasn't about ability. It was a wall of accessibility. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because it's yep. a game of access. Yeah. But the current thing, and, and a lot of people hate it because, you know, regardless of how you feel about influencers, they've changed the game. You know what I mean? And I mean, yeah. not always for the better, but they've changed the game. You yep. know, and that's that's pretty interesting, you know? And, and what's your take on, on on you know, kind of this, this change in filmmaking? So we had two pros on our set who do filmmaking for a living. They do commercials. And when we first started, I don't want to say that there was resistance, but they went into it and they had a first time director and we'll call myself and Freddie first time cinematographers. Cause it was our first like real film outside of like yeah. 48 hour film festivals. And I, we'd done some other stuff, but like they didn't know us. We're not in the Portland scene on stuff. And so yeah. there was definitely some resistance and a little bit of like condescension and, it evaporated the first time, you know, we were loading stuff in. I hadn't shown anybody any of the stills or anything. And we had one night where we had our Jason guy just, you know, kill somebody. And it was really awesome. And I shared some of the stills with people. I was like, hey, scope this out. This is what we got last night. And you that their attitude towards us evaporated almost overnight because they were like, oh, wow. Like, they actually know what they're doing. But, you know, there was a before and after there. Um, yeah. And, you know, there was a, so there was a little bit of kind of gatekeeping there. And I wonder part of it was they probably didn't know if we were, you know, idiots or not because they hadn't really seen anything. And, the you know, productions are interesting when they get started. You know, it took a minute to get the crew going. Um, and now they've been great. But I definitely feel like there's a wall there. Um, you see it all the time with people. And I 
like you said, you know, we there's a there's a scene here in Portland where there's kind of a click. Uh, you're either in it, you're not. And I'm sure a lot of a lot of people seem really nice, but I'm not a big fan of joining those little groups. And I'm also not the biggest fan of a lot of the work that they do. But they they seem to think that they're great. And you know, here we are with our little movie and just smashed everything that everybody's done in the last couple of years. And there's some exceptions, but you know, it, it, it's. And it's interesting because I don't want to be like, oh, our thing's great and it's so much better. But, you know, they definitely snubbed us for filming a fan film. And next thing you know, we're like sold out, sold out the Hollywood theater here in town, uh, which is like the theater for Portland film. So we had our premiere, sold it out. And then during the pandemic, too, which is I thought it'd be harder. And it was we just tickets just flew, flew and flew. Uh, and you know it's just smashing views we got adrian king in it and a lot of people didn't know that so when they saw her name attached uh you know she has a, a bigger name and you could just see those things come go back to like jealousy and then when i see people snipping at us in comments um online we're like oh yeah you know the fan film and it's like yep here you go with your shitty attitude and you're only hurting yourself yeah you know and that's the thing like I don't understand, and there is, I was going to ask you about that. Did you guys ever feel some condescension about making a fan oh, film? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Totally. I and mean, I, it was, the first the first trailer we did, um, you know, I James and I have been friends for a while. We met through music, and uh, he's super creative. He's got great vision. He's really good at production design, and we have a very similar aesthetic, and we work great together. Um, and so we had been working on pre-production for Jason Rising for a while, but I would say outside of like four people, when we filmed the first trailer, that was the first time that most people had met each other or had any idea of kind of what we were trying to go for. And I think when people showed up and saw the props, they were like, oh, this looks good. But beforehand, they're like, oh, fan film, like Freddie, who, you know, was here from the start to the finish of the movie and it was great. And I think he was just like, oh, I don't expect much from this. It's a fan film. And like, you know, there was a little bit of a... Uh, condescension even from him who's on who's on the team and definitely some of the actors at first were a little bit nervous and and once they started showing up and they started seeing what we were doing they're like oh wait this this feels really good but outside of um the group there was definitely some people who didn't sign on because it was a fan film um mm -hmm. we had you know i'm pretty sure the director who we approached didn't sign on because it was a fan film and he didn't want to be associated with it you know and and now we're hitting a lot of trade we got press um black magic design reached out to me because of the movie i never that's thought awesome. that would happen in a million years but like they're reaching out to me and saying oh my god we love the movie that's great let's let's chat so then i've talked to black magic a couple times and that how cool is that like the camera company yeah. i use and love reached out and said we love the movie and like i don't see that happening from the, some of the other movies i don't mean to gloat but you know i think no, no, people that's... were afraid to afraid to look dumb uh but by yeah. doing the same thing that they've been doing and working on the same like little indie drama stuff people get just stuck isolated in themselves. a box yeah and this is my yep. th there's such an idea and i see this in like the entire industry and music industry too a way that things are supposed to be and that's that's yep. That you know, this these preconceived ideas are the the death of creativity, and that's yeah. like the thing too. Like, what was it? Um, even some of the there was a a, a Harry Potter film film that the director got major acclaim. You know, and, and was it the uh, oh I can't Legend of the Air or something like that? And then they did one about look. Snape. There's another one about Snape and. Nice. Uh, yeah, and so there was a couple there, and then people are doing the... But they were really, really, really good. And they were just, you know, the idea was simply that they were set in that universe, you know? Yeah. And, I mean, if you wanted to pick hairs on some of them, sure, you know, the acting can improve, but so can on indie films. So can on yeah. other things, you know what I mean? It's like... I had wish I did all the VFX on our movie, and there were some of the gunshots where I wish I had had a little bit more time to like nail them and then i watched breach with bruce willis which is out on amazon and i was like you know what no we're great we're we're good i have all my flaws that i was feeling bad about I'm like no we're good we are we have such a better movie than that movie and they had money they had thomas jane and bruce willis and promotional yes. materials i'm getting seen ads for it and, and so their budget is you know I don't even know what that's at let's guess there 20 million at the minimum there are some Hollywood movies it. these days that I don't know how they come out and I'm not I, I'm not 
I'm not saying that if I was given a million dollars or 10 million or 20 million or 100 million that it costs, that I would do it right. I'm not saying it, but I am saying that there is some stuff that's made that sometimes you got to go. You have to sit there and wonder, is there not someone in the train of like a, a, a yeah. chain of command who's sitting there going, you know, this might not be that good. Yeah. I, I don't know how those things get made, especially with all the like the gatekeepers like we we're talking about. Like, aren't, if you're going to do anything, aren't you helping the quality get better? And apparently, right. like, <laughs> stuff is slipping through the cracks. So, <laughs> what was it? There was a movie that I watched. I can't remember what it was, but it was literally just like one of the worst things I've ever seen. Like, and I was just like, I felt dumber after watching this movie, and I was. I can't remember what it was, but I, I, I sat there and it gave me this entire existential crisis where I'm like, I'm talented. Why am I? These people are making things. Why am I not able to make something like that? Yeah. And Bruce, but by it Bruce motivates Willis me. Is one of I those. I gotta watch it. You know, I gotta look it up. Gotta see how far you can make it. I mean, it's it doesn't get better, and that's the thing. Like you wonder, like, oh, is it gonna get better at the end? No, it, it doesn't, and it, it's just astronomically bad. So, <laughs> that's awesome. It is every step of the way too. But they had money again. Like they, somebody had money and they did it. So I don't know if like it's somebody's kid that directed and it's their first one. But even if it was a film school film, like I, and I had to grade it, I'd be angry at the person. Right. Because there's no quality control there. Right. <laughs> now that, that that makes me wonder. Like I I think sometimes that I think sometimes people skate through on. So this is one of my issues. And I think this is a danger and a strength that that we have entered a time period where buzz and is really overpowering everything. And, yep. and, and, and you gotta love it. And let's let's reframe it in a most perfect way. Hansel, he's so hot right now. You exactly. Know? Zoolander it's, nailed it. <laughs> Zoolander predicted it. Before social media really was a thing, Zoolander knew where it was going. Hansel, he's so hot right now. And I mean, I tend to feel that the industry, music, film, uh, creative arts, is, is, has, has not watched Zoolander and taken the lessons that that these really really hot people could teach you you know it's it's about that buzz and it's interesting because it's funny because i you know there's some movies um where like uh, i was talking to a friend about the new suicide suicide squad that james gunn directing and you know depending on what buzz you heard about it depends on your opinion of the movie i have a friend who didn't hear anything about it watched it and he loved it It it's so good And, and i'm like it got overhyped for me because it was just, it felt like a little bit of a letdown and it's great. And I love so much about it, but I was like, I, I, I walked away and I was like, I watched it. I enjoyed it, but it wasn't anything more than that to me. And I just, you know, Stallone got buzz and I'm like, his, his performance for the shark, I thought sucked. Like, and? I'm like that just, it was bad, but people are like, Oh, that so was good. a great like, impersonation as well. <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, you bought into the buzz. That was just, mm-hmm. I don't know, it was weird. And I, I love all the actors in there. I mean, they did so much stuff right. But, like, because they got overhyped, it's just Do you know the perfect example of this? The perfect example of this is of and when buzz completely goes wrong, Ben and Fraser. Yeah. Like, the guy's making a comeback right now. And, I mean, not saying that the Mummy movies were the greatest cinematic experiences ever, but the guy was solid. You know, outside yeah. of his, he was a solid thing, but the buzz kind of drifted away and he gained a little weight and then they just were like, they, 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 they shelved him, you know? Yeah. And he had to work his way back through the indie circuit and try to rebuild his way up. But then, you know, there was this, this thing recently where they were interviewing him and he was like, you know, they're like, dude, the internet's pulling for you. And he was like, started crying. He's like, I didn't change. And he's literally yeah. the nicest guy, you know? I know. And I love the Mummy movies. I think uh, I think if anybody deserves, like, a redemption and, like, a late right. career bloom, it's him. You know, right. huge, huge fan. Like, he was so good in, like, Airheads. and Right. The, the Mummy movies were classics, in my opinion. Like, you know, some of the CGI might not hold up, but, like, they were freaking great. So, yeah. They yeah. were what they were. And he was yep. who he was. You know, he was George of the Jungle. The guy, you got to give the guy credit for doing 
anything. And he didn't, <laughs> and, he, and he didn't take himself seriously. No. You know, he was never the guy who was like, I, I worked on some big sets with some people. And I can tell you this. There are some people who drink their own Kool-Aid. And <clears throat> we'll just say Tristan it that way. Bale, I freaking out on the set of Terminator <laughs> Salvation. And, and the thing is, like, I love him, but it's hard. I'm like, how do you how do you reconcile somebody being that good and enjoying them and also just kind of like freaking the hell out on somebody? Like, that's just not yeah. a normal thing. I, I remember I was on set. I'm not going to name names. There was one actor that I, I really loved. And on this big set, I was Tell I me was it's not working. Tom Cruise. No, it's not. It's not. It's not. Okay. It's not that. Uh, I was working <laughs> as a stand, and the guy's really cool. And I think he's probably still a cool person. But what he did to me was really uncool. So I was a stand-in, right? And you know, and so I was working with the crew. I was working with lighting, and and honestly, for me, it was such an awesome experience because I got yeah. to learn. I got to learn. I was just watching all these filmmakers work. It was so cool. But for the actors there's this hierarchy, you know, and like this person. And so this was, you know, this guy's is easy, easy. A lister kind of, kind of high B, low A. And I walked up and he, my friend, I made friends with all the other actors and they were just cool as guys, you know, and I walked up to, to get some food at crafty. I walk up and I'm at crafty and he's like there, he sees me walk up. He sees me. And I'm talking to my friends and he looks at me turns around and walks away. And I'm like, am I some type of virus? Like that you literally have to avoid me and walk away. And it was multiple times that this happened. And I would just was like, you get someone like Dwayne Johnson. Like I actually love the rock because of the rock understands where he's come from and, and who is his, who is his fan base? You know, you, you watch his Facebook and Instagram and the guy's like, you know, like rolling. He's like, all right, this is going to be great. And he drives up next to a bus of people. He's like, hey, you know where The Rock lives? And everyone's like, oh my God! You know, and that's awesome. <laughs> but I it's heard awesome. stories about him from a manager back at a job where her family knew his family grew up or something. And they were always like, he's the nicest person, always has been. And this is before he blew up. I mean, he was just transitioning to acting from wrestling at that point. And they had nothing but high regards for him. And it's like, oh, that's cool. And then you just you watch his career just skyrocket. And I'm like, what? A, yeah. It couldn't happen to a better guy. I'm also pulling for uh, Dave Bautista. Um, right? You know, he's different, a different Such caliber. a great uh, actor. Let's be real. He's an actor. Yep. Blade Runner was the one where I was like, <sighs> I put I, I had, hell, that I intro. had it on before 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 we got him on our interview. I was watching Blade Runner twenty forty nine and just yeah. that the the, the 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 simple way that he plays with his glasses, you know, I just was like he takes them off and I was like <gasps> Yeah. Mm. I had this yep. discussion once with with this is so so this is I don't I don't know if you know much about the world of acting but there's this interesting split in the acting community between people who believe that an actor should be themselves in a role think about your your Tom Cruise no Tom yep. not Tom Hanks uh, even yep. Denzel you know Denzel is Denzel but then yep. there are the, there's the group that think that an actor should be someone else you know think about daniel day lewis think about yep. tom hardy you know they're a different person in each role i find myself in that camp there's a lot of people who are in this camp but you know that is the epitome of what that role was all about you know it's just transformed yeah. into someone else and it's interesting i think both approaches work um you know, Agreed. I I have there's people on both sides of the aisle that I love, and you know, sometimes comedy especially. I, I think when you, if you mix them, you screw it up. But if you find yeah. the right person for the role and you hire somebody because you want them in that role, I think those are you know, if you do it right, I think they they both work out great. And it's not me trying to split the difference on it. I just think that no, you know, no, no, sometimes no. you can't have Daniel Day Lewis in every movie. <laughs> that would yeah. not work. That would <laughs> no, It'd be overwhelming. Um, or Gary Oldman. Yeah, oh, God, I yeah. love Gary Oldman. Now, now, I, yeah. I want to ask you a question. Um, if you could give advice to your younger self, what type of advice would you give yourself? Great question. I'll, I'll use an example where on Jason Rising, we learned I learned how to do set building. And it's just something that never, I never thought that I could do that. And then once you do it, you're like, oh, this is great. And then now I have an idea. I can go build it. I can age it. I can do whatever I want. 
and that applied to the boat that applied to building the whole of our boat and a bunch of other stuff like i've reused some of the wood in my yard a million times already just built a bunch of stuff with it and it never crossed my mind for years that you can do that and i think it's like be bold be brave and don't wait for permission like you don't need somebody to say oh you can do this just go right go do it you want to do it go do it and the more you work with different people the more you learn you're just going to grow so fast. And mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, if I had my skill set now that I do when I was like, or my early twenties, I mean, I'd be unstoppable. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm dealing with the same thing. I'm dealing with the same thing with, with this podcast. A lot of people are like, go slow, you know, take it easy. You don't need to go. And I'm like, I'm booked every single day from now for a month. I just, wow. I went yeah. on it. And I'm like, yep. and the idea being, you know what? I can slow down later when things yeah. take off, but I don't yep. have time for that. And the algorithm favors regularity. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I have friends, um, I'm not going to name them, but like somebody who was involved in the movie uh, that we just shot. Oh, the first time I had it, somebody approached me to film a movie, I said yes, even though I thought the project wasn't going to be the best, but I was like, oh, I want that experience. And my friend said, you're not ready. And I'm like... I'm not, but you're never, if you wait till you're ready, when are you? you're never, when? yeah, you'll never do it. We weren't ready when we started Jason Rising, but guess what? We did it and we finished strong and we got good yeah. fast. I mean, that was you're, film school. You're never ready. Do it anyway. Yep. <laughs> yep. I mean, yeah. So I, I don't know. I, and then also with the music videos, you know, went gangbusters and just, filmed so many of them and, and people like were like slow down slow down why are you doing so many i'm like you you know you gotta learn and if you just do one a quarter or something like that which is you know an approach i've seen other people do i'm like you just you don't you don't learn enough like you don't do enough yeah. you kind of get stuck in the same rut it seems like um i don't know it's in putting yourself out there i've had just crazy opportunities i've worked with bands that i grew up listening to now um i mean it's just awesome. this wouldn't have happened if i wasn't out there and doing what i was doing at the pace i'm doing that's awesome now now let's imagine that you you have a uh, aladdin's lamp the genie pops out it's the robin williams version obviously and yeah. uh <laughs> um, of course <laughs> gotta be um let's imagine you got one wish and we're not talking, you know, of course, I, and I, everyone understands, you know, healing the world, world peace, of course, are things people would wish for. I'm talking about something for you. What, what, what would you wish for? That's a great question. It, and it's funny because, like, you have, like, career, you have art and all that stuff. Um, I think I would wish for my dogs to live forever. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're looking at the art side of the fence, um, I think it would be the ability to probably be able to do film and like film related stuff and music for a living. Uh, I, I have a day job right now. I could probably charge more and make a living doing music videos, but I want to work with the artists that I want to. And that that's kind of, I'm at a weird place where, you know, I want my, I want the Pacific Northwest to be on the map. And that was one of those things where when I started my music video business, that was the first sentence that I wrote when I had kind of had a goal. And every once in a while when I go, I go back and I try to look at that and, and say like, why did I start doing this? When you get pissed or you get frustrated, you work with a horrible yeah. artist. Um, yeah. Or somebody who's difficult. I shouldn't say horrible. But, you know, I go back and I look at that. I'm like, this is, oh, that's right. This is what I want to do. And every time I read that, I get supercharged and energized. Like, I want Portland to be on the map. I want it to be like the Seattle of the 90s for the grunge. Like, I want well, it look to be at, that for music now. Look at, look at right now. Atlanta came up. You know, New Orleans came up. Why, why not Portland? It's, it's, it's a yeah. possibility. Yeah. But it takes so, enough you know, people like yourself that are hustling to make it happen. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, we have we have the artists um i don't know i'm surprised more people haven't hit but that said there's been quite a few bands that have been signed that are doing some really cool stuff these days i just i think a lot of it too is there's not um you don't have that one gatekeeper like mtv or something where uh you, you know you can have bands blow up huge in their niche and nobody outside of that niche will have ever heard of them yeah so it's it's really interesting like we have a band right now i did a video for that they're out on tour and they're blowing up like crazy and i'm watching them blow up i'm like this is so good but people in my other bands have never heard of them uh, <laughs> so i'm like how does that happen right well i yeah. dude i i i really appreciate all your advice today and your thoughts now if you could give give the people listening some one last bit of advice what, what would it be tonight 
I would say stick through it. You know, I look at Jason Rising and that was a labor of love. It was two years. We thought it was going to be like a three month project. Um, and there were some really down points uh, while filming and trying to get the movie across the finish line. There's down points when you're editing. There are down points trying to get it started, in, in fact. Um, but, you know, if you push through them and you work hard, there's always an upswing. Um, you know, yeah. if you can stick with it, it will, you will come out of that negativity. And the other part is understanding that that negativity is going to hit. And when it does hit, it feels real. Um, but you can get through it. And when you ride that wave through it, the top is going to be that much better. And one practical example was the first time we did an assembly cut and I shared it with somebody who was on the project. I just got depressed for like two months because it was so bad. Mm. And I was just like, how are you going to, how are we going to fix this? But you know, you start chipping away at it. You know, mm -hmm. I made a three page list and I fixed it, watched it again with uh, somebody else who hadn't seen it. And because having that person in a room, uh, you see all the flaws in your movie and you're like, Oh no. Mm. And so I made another three page list and start fixing that. And next thing you know, the list dwindles and it keeps getting smaller and smaller. And then when you have the sold out premiere at the Hollywood theater and everyone's cheering when your actors come on screen and when somebody dies and you know, all the things happen, you're just like, this is the coolest moment. Like I need to savor this and enjoy it. So That's ride awesome. the waves. Yeah. Ride the waves. Ride the waves. It, will, it will come up on top. That's awesome. Well, I really appreciate your time tonight, man. Thank you for sharing your yeah. wisdom. Thank you so much for having me on. Uh...